Adam Wu interviews Jesus. This is a general question session. The interview took place in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia, on the 8th of October, 2012. How do I look? Is this okay? Is the money made? Does he look cool enough? Is the money made? Does he look cool? Am I going for cool? Am I going for cool? Does the, does the, uh, the, the Elvis hat in the shop? Oh, no, it's... I didn't care which side I was in. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So let's get started. So, can you please state your name and explain to us who you are? Well, um, my name that I was given at this life is Alan John Miller. I was born in a little town in the Riverland of South Australia called Loxton. And uh, basically, that's, that's how most people recognise me. Most people who, who still recognise me of that call me AJ, short for Alan John. Um, but the reality is I am Jesus and, and, so, uh, and I've had a life for the last 2,000 years that I remember. But aside from that, I don't think I'm any more unique or special than anybody else. Beautiful. Yeah. So, from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, what is it that you do on an average day? <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty hard question, Adam, um, because every day for me is different. So, yeah. so we don't really have a standard day. Myself and Mary don't have a standard day um, because every single day, we sort of believe that every single day you should just do what you desire to do and whatever it is you're passionate to do. Yeah. And I think you probably lived your life very similarly by the sounds. So we don't really have a standard day, you know, a day that we, we could say we get up at a certain hour and go to bed at a certain hour. Mm. On the average, when we're home, and we've only been home two months of the year this, this year, um, so out of eight months we've been, or nine months we've been home too, when we're home, we sort of like to get up when it pretty much is daybreak and we go to bed. Uh, usually we're sleeping down in our tent, which you'll probably see later and we go to sleep when it, when it gets dark. So we don't have any power down there or any electricity or any lights or anything like that. So, so generally we wake up with the birds and go to bed with the birds as well. <laughs> and, and in between that, it just depends on, on what we desire to do. So if, if we're home, quite often I love working out in the garden and doing things like that. We do a lot together, myself and Mary. So um, you know, we have a, quite a nice time <clears throat> together. When we're traveling, then it's very, very different, you know, yeah. so it's very different depending on where we are and what we're doing. Um, every single day for us is completely different, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, totally. So, uh, we just arrived here and you gave us one heck of a great meal. Well, I Mary. didn't. Mary. Mary. Mary, Mary and Lynn, Thank you actually. very much, Mary. <laughs> um, what, what is your favorite food? What is my favourite food? I don't think I have a favourite, Adam. Yeah? Yeah. I would probably classify fruit as my favourite food, but there are so many fruits that I love that it's pretty hard for me to select what is my favourite out of all of the fruits that I love. Um, as Mary knows, like I'm just really love all to any, pretty much any kind of fruit. There's probably only one fruit that I don't like, and that's uh, pawpaw. Because <laughs> uh, I don't like how it smells when I'm eating it. But, yeah. but aside from that, I just love fruit. Um, and it's, but, but there's no real food that I have, you know, no one food that I feel more passionate about yeah. than any other. So, and as Mary knows, when I eat, generally I make a lot of noise uh, when, <laughs> when, when the food is good. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I just appreciate good food like probably most other people would. Mm. Yeah. So. And we had a good meal, didn't we? Yeah, we had a great meal. <laughs> I could eat like that every day. Yeah, exactly. You're a lucky man. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, the documentaries done on you on YouTube, mm -hmm. and, um, 60 Minutes to Current Affair, and I think one reoccurring thing that I noticed too was that you like to play music a lot. Yep. Uh, I remember seeing you play a Green Day song and Mad World. Yeah. And um, I just want to know, what are some of your favorite bands and music? Uh, again, I'm just I have a wide ranging interest in music. So right from classical, I, I love to play classical guitar, mm -hmm. 
uh, right the way through to rock and sometimes really heavy rock and uh, just depends give on... Give us some names, give us some names. Well, you know, like I, I love some Led Zeppelin while at the same time as I love some, uh, well, some classical music from the 1700s, you know, like so, from, in, on, in guitar in particular. Um, so, yeah, there's a whole range in between that that, that I love. I, I grew up with, in you know, with the 60s music. Yeah. And so I suppose I have a bit of a affinity towards towards that. Um, so wait, wait, with the '60s now, I guess the universal question being: Are you a Stones guy or a Beatles guy? <laughs> well, I have to you say, say both. yeah, yeah. I, know, I understand. I understand. It must be a choice. And yeah. <laughs> um, I'd probably, in terms of, if you're asking me who the best band is, well, I'd have to say they're pretty much on a par, but. But in terms of what I have the most affinity to, probably the Beatles. Beatles. Yeah. Knew it. Probably. Knew it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I would stand on sympathy for the devil. <laughs> oh, no, I don't think it's that. It's more, um, I think it's more the Stones. I don't know. I think, I think it's more that I, I was brought up singing along to Beatles songs. Mm. So, you know, a, a lot of it is that. And my parents probably would have been a bit stressed out by the Stones <laughs> <laughs> at the time. So, you know, I probably didn't get as much exposure to the Stones when I was small. Yeah. So, with that, what are, uh, if you were on a desert island, I know this is another weird question. If you were on a desert island, what is the one CD you would have? Bearing in mind that there'd be no power and <laughs> yeah, so you player in a battery and a battery that will last for maybe a couple of hours. Rechargeable, rechargeable with coconuts. With coconut, yeah. with coconut oil or something. Yeah, they did it on Gilligan's Island. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, again, it would be very difficult for me to make a choice. I'd probably have to make up my own CD. Yeah, <laughs> a mix, a mix, a mix. Oh, and and take it with me. Um, you can you can have like an anthology of greatest hits, you know, a box set. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think I'd have to go for a heap of different songs that uh, that are wide, again, wide ranging yeah. from from popular to to classical. Classic. Um, and put it on one CD. I think. The next CD. Yeah. You can't have another box, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, loosening up again. Uh, what uh, what are some of your favorite TV shows, and movies, if you even watch? Um, probably my most favourite movie would be Groundhog Day. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty corny, I know. No. Um, mostly, I think, because the guy has to learn how to change. Mm. And he, he has to sort of, he has to learn how to become more loving without anybody telling him how. Mm. Uh, I think I, li I like that, uh, that whole analogy. Um, Aside from that, myself and Mary like love watching movies of all kinds. Yeah. Um, Just when you watch Jaws. Yeah, yeah. Time. Mary, Mary had watched it before, and I, I'd never seen it. So, uh, so Mary got it out the other day, and we watched Jaws. Yeah. <laughs> scare you? No, no. Movies <laughs> don't scare me much anymore. But um, it, it, it was a good movie. I thought. Yeah, yeah definitely a good movie. And. Um, you know, I, I also ha like disaster movies, and I like action movies, and I like some good dramas. So, you know, some stuff that's got some decent character development. Yeah. I think a lot of the stuff that comes out now sort of is a bit low on the character development and a bit too high on the special effects. And um, but we really love some character development stuff. So, so some of some of my favourite shows are also you know. Uh, you know, like Jane Austen inspired, I suppose you could say. <laughs> I'm a bit of a romantic, as Mary knows, so yeah. that also, uh, I have some attraction to those kind of movies. TV shows, and uh, I don't know if I, I had some favorites when I was a kid. Mm. Uh, like MASH would have been one of my most yeah. favorite shows, I think, when I was a kid. Uh, Get Smart, you remember that? Yeah, yeah. of course. Um, I don't know if they still, they still play it on well, there. They did, the did a remake movie, <laughs> yeah. Steve Carell, yeah. And, and um, and I think I think with Get Smart I was more attracted to the romance part of it than, <laughs> than anything. It was else. such a hopeless romance. It was. <laughs> so on movies, um, what is your opinion of movies that try to biopic the story of your life? Things like uh, Passion of the Christ. Um, 
Well, well, I think Mel did a fairly good job with mm-hmm. Passion of the Christ. Um, it, it was pretty close to the last day and a half of my life in terms of my actual experiences. There was a little bit of exaggeration with the devil in the background, yeah. you know, uh, and all of those kind of things, which comes from the Bible, but certainly wasn't a part of my my experience. Mm. But uh, but it was pretty accurate in terms of the amount of violence and, and pretty accurate in terms of depicting the general demeanour of the people who knew me and the people who didn't. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was a pretty well done. I think a lot of the others... Uh, have Learned been, of her. Yeah, a lot of them <laughs> have been taken from the Bible yeah. and, and with different slants that, that weren't too correct, whereas what I liked about what Mel did it was just sort of the time that I was in the Garden of Gethsemane through to the time of my death mm. and, uh, and shortly after... And, and there wasn't too much could, that could go wrong in that yeah. little area or slice in the sense of uh, what my life was depicted as. But, but aside from that, um, the other attempts that I have observed, I haven't seen many of them. Um, you know, they, they weren't as well done. I feel they tried to depict a lot of my life from, directly from the Bible and a lot of what the Bible says about my life. Uh, some of, a lot of it is true, but there's also quite a lot of supposition mm. uh, and, and embellishment that came later and that had nothing to do with my life either. So, so yeah, one day it would be interesting to see if somebody would make an accurate story of it. Yeah. I'm not that addicted to seeing a story of my own life. I don't <laughs> know what my own life is. <laughs> I'm sure there will be plenty of remakes for the next couple of hundred years. Yeah, I don't know, you know, I think once people realise that I'm just the same as they are, Mm -hmm. then maybe they won't be so focused on trying to depict me as being some kind of Mm God-man. So, do you know what an internet meme is? Well, it it was an interesting thing that when you sent that question to me, I I said, what in the earth is a (laughs) meme? I didn't even know how to pronounce the word. (laughs) We've got to keep up with the times. Exactly. I don't even know if that's even that word either. Well, now that I know what one is, I don't have one. No. <laughs> a favourite, no. Um, I think Mary has seen a few that she could nominate as her favourites. Can you explain what it is? Do you want uh, to it's basically a, a picture on the internet where you'll see like a white font up top and at the bottom that basically makes a joke or something. Um, I, I would ask you to bust out the ones that you've been looking at, but they're pretty hilarious. They're pretty <laughs> messed up. But... Uh, I, I guess, uh, what, what's a good one that we can do an example of? We, you know what I, mean? I know a lot of them, but... I know, they're all of them pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty inappropriate. <laughs> we won't <Right>. be offended. <laughs> Let's pass on this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, so, I have no idea what one is. Anyway, yeah. so. <laughs> so, as Jesus, is your favourite time of year Christmas? No, actually. What is your favourite time of year? Um, my favourite time of year is any time I get to spend with Mary, pretty much. Um, oh, man, you're <laughs> killing me with this romance. Yeah, well, that's uh, underlying. I am a bit of a romantic, but um, I I would find I find Christmas one of my least favourite times yeah. of the year, mostly because I feel like there's all this effort to be loving at, at one point of the year right, right. when my feelings are why can't we have like Christmas every day of the year? and everybody be loving each other every day of the year and war stop every day of the year and so forth yeah. um, I just feel like it's a bit fake um, this whole idea that that we can stop all the negativity for one day of the year and then return to it the very next day yeah. it, it, to me that's a very damaging concept actually um, so also I don't have any that you know that wasn't the time I was born either so right. there's no Link to my. I love the confusion with that too. Mm. What, uh, what would you say is the time that you were born? Well, I was born in between September and October, mm. um, rather than in December. And people chose December after my death because it was the time that people in Rome worshipped the sun god. Solstice. So yeah, because of the because of the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere, and. and uh, yeah, so, you know, it was chosen for a lot of different reasons other yeah. than just, you know, a, point, a time when I was born. Yeah. So speaking of uh, Christmas, uh, let's find out. What is uh, the best slash worst gift you've ever been given or received? <laughs> I got it now. 
Well, you're going to go all corny again. Oh, you're going to think I'm all corny again. But probably the best gift that I've ever received was the, in this life, was the first time I met Mary again. Mm. That was great. Um, and yeah, it, it was a really strange feeling actually meeting her again. Um, because it was, I, I was all, for the first time for the for probably four or five years, I was very very nervous, yeah. <laughs> and also Mary was going through things of her own, so I didn't disclose to her, her anything about my interest in her or anything yeah. like that. So, but but it was beautiful just to see her again. So that to me probably. Do you still get butterflies in your stomach? Yeah, yeah. all the time, as That's Mary awesome. knows. Yeah, pretty much constantly. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> do you, do you, I have this thing where when I hold my girlfriend's hand, my yeah. palms get sweaty. Yeah. Boy, yeah. yeah. You too. I don't know if I get sweaty. Well, in this, <laughs> in this Aussie weather, jeez. Yeah, it's really hot. It was really hot. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just, yeah, any time I can get to spend with Mary is always a good time. That's and, awesome. And, um, and so that would be the, definitely the best gift. The, the very worst gifts I've received would be a, a group... You've got a lot of followers, so we got to... I'm sure you've been given a gift that's just hilarious. Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't call them followers either, um, because most of them don't follow me anyway, <laughs> anywhere I go, or, or what I do in my day-to-day -day life. But um, the worst gifts are when people give me a gift because it's a thing they would buy for themselves. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In other words, they've got no idea of the things I like or dislike or the things that I think are valuable or not. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, they buy something for themselves rather than for me. And so that you can say, it's cool, just keep it. <laughs> yeah, so when, when I receive a gift like that, I, I generally ask them who they bought the gift <laughs> for, <laughs> which sometimes doesn't go down too well. <laughs> okay, so the next two questions are kind of like, those, those really getting to know you kind of questions like mm -hmm. this. Um, mm -hmm. If you could witness any event, past, present, or future, what would it be? Um, can I nominate past, present, and future? <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah, past, I'd love to see the creation of the universe. Mm -hmm. That'd be probably probably one of the highest things on my list. And what and, is that? So, yeah. And then probably the second highest on my list uh, would be to see the cre creation or, or, or the beginning of mankind's life on this earth. That, that would be probably my next thing that I'd like to see. Present, um, present, if I could see it, I would love to see everybody on this planet just living in harmony with, like, in a peaceful condition. It doesn't matter what their beliefs are, doesn't matter what their underlying religious uh, beliefs are or their political persuasions or any other thing. If we could all just get along together in peace, I would love to see that in the present. In the future, there's many things I would love to see. I'd love to see the elimination of pain on the earth and in the spirit world. And I'd love to see, and, where, and whether people worship God or not is really not high on the list. I'd see, love to see them worshiping God, but if they didn't want to, then that's fine too. But as long as they live together in peace and love, then I feel you know, that's something I'd love to see occurring. And also, just this reduction of pain. You know, there's so much pain that people experience over long periods of time, and, and a lot of people don't realize on the earth, but many people who pass into the spirit world are also still in a state of pain. And I would love to see that kind of pain eliminated, bearing in mind that I know that uh, it's able to be you know, eliminated from, from our life. Yeah. So that, that'd be the things I'd love to see. Yeah. Let's pause for a sec, guys. That's cool with you. Yeah, sure. Hey, Bobby. So, uh, your, your take on marijuana is straight up. Um, I would take it. Um, well, no, I feel, I feel that, that every single herb that has ever been created has a role from a medicinal purpose, certainly. But um, anything that modifies your physiological function, in the end, you don't need once, right. once you've worked your way through the emotional reasons why you need it. So in the end, you wouldn't want to take it. Um, what I notice it does is that it does upset the energetic stabilisation of the spirit body. Mm. And just like any other 
like alcohol does too, by the way, and so does cigarette smoking, and so does coffee, actually. Mm. Um, and once you... You see things I love. Yeah, yeah <laughs> most, people, most people, you know. Yeah. Um, but once you work your way through what attracts you to all that, which right. is usually emotion, then in the end you don't feel like taking it. Like, in fact, you, you get quite put off take, no, you know, if you take it, so you, you don't feel attracted to it at all. Um, so now if I had a coffee, like I'd probably probably be jittery for a week yeah. um, and I find it very disconcerting yeah. now having a coffee but before I used to drink it black with you know three spoonfuls of coffee oh, and man. I'm going for that <laughs> yes. I hold the sugar over for eight seconds <laughs> and, then don't, and it'll be like a cup that big yeah, yeah. all right yeah. so let's get into the, some of the human nature questions um, sure <clears throat> should homosexual behavior be regarded as uh, immoral what do you think uh, can we re- Go back to one other question. Absolutely. Uh, because oh, battle story. Like yeah, that. yeah. I forgot yeah. to mention probably yeah. my favourite uh, tele- television. Back up on the homosexuals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> battle story. Yeah, like yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry, guys. And uh, yeah, because uh, Battle Star Galactia has to be one of the best, <laughs> one of the best tele shows I've seen. Not the old one, but the new why, one. Why? Why? Why the? Uh, just because there was. Are you just into the sci-fi thing. Oh no, there's a mixture of drama, mm-hmm. there's a good character development, although I would have liked to see some of the characters develop a bit further in a positive direction than they did. And, uh, but, but just a great story, uh, and also... Musical uh, score. Musical score was excellent. Just mm-hmm. a whole whole thing mixed together, good good acting. You don't watch Game of Thrones. You no, I haven't seen that. Yeah. You, you have to. Cause You're it, mentioning a few I've never seen. So, uh, just, uh, just, you could watch it on the internet. I'll yeah. show you. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> can we, can let's we move on to the Let's move on to the homosexual. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, do you think homosexual behavior should be regarded as immoral? Well, it depends what kind of behavior you're suggesting is homosexual. So, I'm not talking about marriage. I'm just talking about just a man being with a man or a woman being with a woman. Yes. Yeah, so if I'm, if you're talking about just a man being sexually with a man or a woman being sexually with mm-hmm. a woman, then from God's perspective, that behavior is not immoral. Mm-hmm. If you're talking about uh, promiscuity, mm-hmm. then that's a different matter. Heterosexuals are just as right. able to be involved in promiscuity as homosexuals, and those kind of behaviours do cause damage to the human soul. They cause damage to the way you feel, the way you think, and they also cause damage to other people, usually, because other people usually feel harmed through those particular actions. And, uh, and also, uh, we must understand the way the soul is constructed. The soul is constructed in two halves. So when the soul separates and incarnates onto the planet, then the two halves are attracted to two bodies. So they're either, they'll either be attracted to a male or female body, and both halves can be attracted to the same type of body. So they can both be attracted to a male body, or they can both be attracted to a female body. It depends upon how much femininity and masculinity is in the total soul and how it splits. So from that perspective, if you look at the way the actual, the science, if you like, of the way the soul splits, homosexuality is just the same from God's perspective as heterosexuality. Um, And obviously, um, obviously promiscuity, which is a different issue, uh, I feel, well, that's a different, uh, there's a different answer to that, I feel. Mm-hmm. But, but if you're just talking about homosexual behaviour compared to heterosexual behaviour from God's perspective, they're both the same if the people have a loving arrangement with each other, yeah. if, they, if, if they're in love with each other. And love is the marriage anyway, so if you're talking about marriage, love is the marriage. If there's no love, in, if two people living together and there's no love, well, they're not mar- really married, right. even if they think they are. So, what are your thoughts on divorce and remarriage? Well, if two, like I said just then, if two people are married and living with each other, but they don't, they're not in love with each other, then they've either got to work through the issues of why they don't love each other, and and through that process maybe fall in love with each other again, right. or they need to recognise that love is the binding force of the marriage, not a paper, not a piece of paper. A piece of paper means nothing to God. And to be frank, I think the piece of paper means nothing to most people on the planet, from what you from what you can see. Um, so, and the piece of paper is really nothing but an expression of an intent mm. between two people. And now, I do not believe that you can uh, intend to remain in love with a person for the rest of your existence, unless that person happens to be the other half of yourself right. or your soulmate. And um, 
So whenever two people get together and establish a relationship, from that moment on, from, from a love perspective, love creates the marriage in terms of in their hearts. Right. As soon as those people are out of love with each other, then they are now divorced, in quotation marks, but because they are no longer in love with each other. And, and I do not believe it is correct for people to live together when they do not love each other. And that, that, is, can, that can be a very damaging thing for both the people involved and also for the children, because the children see their parents not in love and then the, the parents are mirroring a relationship that is not a love-based relationship and, and this then damages how the child views a proper relationship. Yeah. So I feel and that... they grow up. Then they grow up and then they, you know, they get into relationships where they stay in because they feel like they have to instead of because of it being a love-based relationship and they finish up taking on the same patterns as, as the parents had because the parents weren't displaying love towards each other and the children weren't growing up in an environment where they could feel the love of the parents, then of course, you know, and, and if the parents are only staying together for the sake of the children, the children also right. grow up with a heap of guilt and other emotions too that they have to work their way through. So I feel the way we see marriage on this planet is very, very damaging. We need to see it as a, as a contract of love rather than a contract on a piece of paper and words. And once we see it like that, then we'll see that as soon as we're not in love with each other, then divorce has already occurred. Now, we have the choice at that point to redevelop the love. And I do suggest that people attempt to redevelop the love because there must be a reason why they no longer love when they used to love. But, uh, but if that is not possible, if one party is not willing to be a part of that development, then obviously it's impossible to proceed when one person doesn't love and the other person does, is even not possible to proceed with a relationship on that basis. Right. Mm. Yeah. So you're, you're a firm believer in the soulmates. I've, I've seen a lot about that, so yeah, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Um, mm. So what is your take on uh, abortion? Well, because I believe the soul, when it incarnates, it incarnates at the time of conception. Mm and not at the time of birth. So I see a child as a, as a person that begins at the time of conception. And so, and so my feelings are, if myself and Mary uh, became pregnant, and not that I can be very pregnant, but Mary would be pregnant. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and then, you know, for some unknown reason, which I wouldn't really understand at this point, um, we didn't want the child, then I would never agree with having an abortion. Right. What I, if, it, if it turned out that the person who was pregnant didn't want the child, I would suggest to them that they, that they take the child to birth and then allow somebody who will love that child to take over the role of being that child's parent. Mm. Mm. And I feel there are far too many abortions that occur on the planet and we have a very frivolous view of life as a result. It's interesting too, I find, that, that we have an idea that a person is not a child until they're born, right. and as soon as they're born, we'll, we'll spend millions of dollars keeping them alive. But before they're born, we spend a few dollars killing them. And I find this is a great inconsistency in, in particularly Western society. Yeah. Mm. So let's get into the universe. Um, you said earlier that if there was one event in the past such present future that you would like to see it be the origins of the physical universe. Mm. Um, what is your opinion on the origins of the physical universe and life on Earth? Where did it all come from? Well, the simple answer to that is I feel it all came from God. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel God existed before the universe exists. I am aware that there are at least 36 dimensional spaces in this universe at this point in time and I've seen many of them personally, so th that means that I have a good understanding generally of how the universe is constructed, but, but I don't have an understanding of how it began, mm -hmm. because nobody was actually present at the time of its beginning aside from God. So, so what I feel is the only way I can learn the answer to the question, you know, the, we can make a lot of suppositions and we can make a lot of investigations, which scientists are currently doing as well, but I believe the only real way to get a complete answer to that question 
is to actually ask a person who was, who was there or ask an individual who was there at the time of the inception mm. of the universe what actually happened. And I believe that only, the only person that, that I know of at this point in time who was present would have been God. And so my focus is, is developing my relationship with God so that I can ask those kind of questions and get answers. Um, so that's what I'm really focused on doing. That being said, um, the universe is constructed quite amazingly at the moment from what I've personally observed. We have layers or boundaries of love that separate different parts of the universe from each other. And, um, and the physical universes have quadrants, if you like, uh, that, that reflect upon the spiritual universe. So matter gets matter in the physical, gets turned into antimatter, and it's spiritual. And this, this matter then uh, also grows or, or, is, or is transferred between the universes, between the physical universe and the other dimensional universes that, are, that we refer to as spiritual in nature, but it's really just a different dimension mathematically. Right. And, um, and so if you, understand, if you can understand the way the universe is constructed, I believe you can uh, also begin to understand that God made a universe that is eternally expanding. Right. That means that as our soul expands in its capacity to understand and experience, it creates a new universe as well. So we actually then become involved in the creation of universes as a result of the expansion of our own soul. And, and I've seen 36 of these universes created over the period of my, of my life. Seven, uh, I should say uh, 30 of them. Seven, six of them already existed before mm -hmm. uh, I was born. And since then, there's been another so 30 or so. Are, are we in just one of those dimensions or are we in all 36 of these? Uh, no, we are in our, our condition of love, our, what, what I would classify as our soul condition in love, determines our position. You've got to love those birds. I know. I've been waking up to them every morning. Uh, self cup of tea. It's very amazing. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, the, our condition in love determines which universe we can e e exist in and which universes we can transfer between. So if our condition of love is, is the same condition as the average person on the earth, then we'll only be able to transfer in one physical space. If it's the same condition as what most people who die pass over into the next dimension um, experience, then they'll only be in one physical space. But as they develop in love, they can, they can go through the interstellar boundaries that separate these locations and therefore go into the next universe as their condition in love grows. Right. How old do you think the Earth is? Um, well, I, I believe from scientific analysis, they've worked out, I think it's about, I think it's about seven billion or so years old, and I think is the, is the under, understanding at this point in time. And that the universe is around about, I think it's about 13 or 14 billion years old. I don't necessarily agree that that's the entire universe that's that age. I feel that it's the little slice that we are in that is that age. Mm. Um, so I, I don't believe the Bible teachings of, you know, things like the earth was created in seven days, mm. or if, or some people say each day was a thousand years, so the earth was created in seven thousand years. I don't God believe. built everything in six days, but on that seventh day he just needed a break. Yeah, and I don't <laughs> believe God needs a break either. <laughs> uh, um, so with, uh, I mean, really on the scale of the universe, we're like not even a dot so far. If, if you were to look up in the map of the universe, we're not even a dot on here. So yeah, that's interesting you say that, Adam, but um, the reality I find is that there's, there's plenty of people that I've met in the spirit world right. who have more energy than our sun. Mm. So, so this indicates to me that we have the capacity to grow bigger than the dot. Right. I feel that in our inception, you know, the very first moment we come here, the our first incarnation, the very first time we're here, we are we are quite small in in our soul. We, our soul is a certain limited space and limited uh, in in time, and and we have the capacity to grow in love. And as we grow in love, we grow in power. We grow in understanding. We grow in wisdom and all these other things. And as we grow, uh, we now have this this potential 
to become much larger than we were before and have much a much larger effect on the universe than we had. So you're saying when I look up at the sky at night out here in Australia where you can actually see all the stars, yeah. that all those aren't stars. Some of those are actually people, so to say. No, not, not really people. Um, I'm saying that there are or people in things, a spiritual right. dimension, right. in a different dimension, not a physical dimension, mm. that actually have enough energy that they have more energy than what our, cur our sun currently can mm. display. So that they have enough personal energy that they are able to create suns of their own, okay. physical, low, you know, things like a sun of their own. And, uh, and this, this is because of the way our soul has been created to expand. This is why I feel that we are the pinnacle of God's creation, because we, we, have, we come in a very small, finite space, and then we have the ability to rapidly and exponentially expand in our awareness, capacity, and our strength and, and physical power that we can display. And then after we pass into the spirit world, after we've died from this earth, our physical body is gone, generally people start embracing this process more readily. Mm. And as a result of that, they grow a little more rapidly generally. And, and they then can begin to use some of this power in loving ways. The only way you can do it is by becoming more loving. Mm. And so the only way we can go from one place to a new dimension is by becoming more loving. And, but once we understand this in the universe, then we start understanding the power that we actually have in our soul as a potential. So you could say at the moment we are like a pinprick seed, like a little a seed, I don't know if you've seen a seed of a very big tree here called a mountain ash. Mm. It's a very, very tiny seed that you can hardly see on your finger. And it grows up into a tree that's 90 metres tall, or in your money that's about 300 feet high. Um, and, you know, circumference of, you know, size of this room. Um, and that's really an illustration of the power, I feel, of our own existence. Right. We, we start being this little tiny seed with a lot of potential, with genetic code in it and all these other things, and we have this capacity to become this huge thing, um, but only if we learn to grow in love. Right. Mm. So do you think there's life on other planets? Definitely, yes. So both, there's, the, there's life like insects, uh, birds, reptiles, other types of life like that, and there is also what you would classify as human life on other planets, right. yes. So, I guess in the shortest way possible, what what happens to humans after death? Heaven, hell, spirits? Uh, well, obviously, you know, you, you could have a long winded <laughs> this guy, but let's give right. you just a basic thing right. about that. When you die, all you lose is your spirit, is your physical body. Right. You, your spirit body looks almost identical to the physical body. So you pass in as, into a different dimension, the first dimension of the spirit world, and you're in a different body. You now have a different body but it looks very similar you have the same mind and a remember and a memory of all of the same experience so you are intrinsically exactly the same person as you were here on earth with one exception and that is that you've now passed from the earth and now living in a different dimension and then from that point in time it just depends on what you choose to do if you choose to live in harmony with love you'll grow and change and as you grow and change you'll expand as I suggested earlier and, and your life and joy and happiness will also expand. If you choose to remain stagnant or do damaging things, your life will continue to shrink mm -hmm. until such a time as your pain becomes unbearable. Now, what that shrinkage process is called is the, is the journey into hell. Right. That's what people on earth call it. Um, it's not a fiery burning. It's not a fiery burning, burning torment yeah. place, but it is a place where there is a lot of hard life pain. and a lot of pain and a lot of emotion to deal with that is very very negative because of what we've created and correspondingly there is this beautiful way of growing in a positive direction growing in high, growing love that's what people refer to as heavens the right. heavens and the reality is there's many heavens you know that, that in each, contrast not a bunch of clouds with virgins no anywhere. no in gold no it's no no i know that uh, you know like some of the religious people on the planet would like to believe such things and really when you think about it though how, how the average person on earth that kind of life wouldn't appeal to very much <laughs> I would suggest no the reality is uh, the spirit body has higher sensory apparatus more sensory apparatus than the physical form it has the ability to sense the universe around it in different ways than the physical form can actually experience the universe and as a result of that you actually experience more things not less things after you pass 
So the majority of people who have passed never wish to come back to Earth again and experience life on Earth because they are having more fun doing, <laughs> doing the things that they're doing in the spirit world in the different dimensions, yeah. So with that, uh, why do you think there is terrible wrongdoing and suffering in the world? I feel the primary reasons for suffering is to do with our inability to, to live a life that's harmonious with love. That's the primary reason why we have suffering on the planet. If you look at almost all causes of suffering on the planet you, and trace them back to something, you will always trace them back to something that happened that was out of harmony with love, generally. And, and you know, this can be quite easily illustrated in all sorts of ways, both medically and, and philosophically and politically and religiously. You can see that even most religions today on the planet don't really practice love completely. You know, they mm -hmm. love maybe their own kind, you know, their own religion, but uh, when it comes to actually loving every single person on the planet, there's very few religions that actually do that very well. So, so if, if you examine the world today, I feel the main reason why we have what we have is because the majority of people on the planet still resist bringing themselves into a state of harmony with love. Right. They, they want to have their own way all the time, rather than thinking about what is the best way for everybody to, you know, and the best way for everybody is, is to be loving. We can still accept each other's different belief systems, different cultures, different backgrounds, everything, but we can do it in love. You and I can have an interaction where we can disagree on a subject, but we can love each other still. You know, we don't have to fight each other and war against each other and cause pain to each other and slander each other and all of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. They are all unnecessary for any intelligent society, really. So the idea of you know living a pretty sinful life and doing a bunch of wrong things and on your deathbed confessing and uh, seeing as how we're taught that God is infinitely forgiving. Do you think that whole idea works? No, not at all. And I taught ever since I've been around I, from the first century I've taught that people do do there are consequences for the behavior that you undertake and no single person can undo these consequences except yourself and while God forgives us it doesn't mean that the consequence is not is is taken away yeah. forgiveness is a very different process forgiveness is a feeling is a feeling that is given to us that the other person has, has felt there was no harm to them in the process. God does not feel that anything we can do to God's universe is harmful to God. So God doesn't have a concept of the same concept of sin that people on earth have. So should one live simply, renounce worldly goals and material possessions? No, I feel one should follow their desires with a passion and then purify their desires and passion into harmony with love. When they do that, they may finish up renouncing some things right. that are out of harmony with love. But there are many things we can be doing as a society with technology and other things that would be completely in harmony with love. So, so my feelings are we need to stop judging things by worldly, not worldly, possessions, not possessions, and all those kind of things. And instead, we should start having the focus of, is this loving to the, to the earth? Is this loving to the people on the earth? Is this loving to the creatures on the earth? If it is loving to all of those things, then why wouldn't I proceed with my passion and desire to go and do what I want to do? Yeah. Yeah. So, what is your opinion on spiritual methods such as like psychics, tarot cards, spirit channeling, and uh, poultry guys? Well, some of these things are true in the sense that they can be done. Um, I feel the effectiveness of such uh, is very dependent upon the condition of the individual doing it. So if the person doing it is in a very dark condition in the sense that they're very unloving, they're very demanding, they're very angry or whatever, then of course the material that they're going to either channel or get from other dimensional you know, existences is going to be very dark and very negative and very much the same as their own condition. If a person improves their spiritual condition in love, then the information they receive through these methods will improve. I do not believe that these things actually help a person become better in love unless they are connecting with a person in another dimension who is higher development in love who can teach us something about love. Mm. So I feel if we focused on 
you know, understanding love better through these methods, and that'd be fine. I don't, I don't feel an addiction to them very much, though. So how, just to step back a second, how, how does one make contact with another spirit from another dimension? Well, every single person on this planet is already making contact with people in other dimensions. And very much of the time, they are dropping thoughts into the minds of people. They are giving them pictures through all sorts of methods, sometimes through visions, sometimes through dreams, sometimes through a feeling of knowing. They are communicating with people to do either good things or bad things, unfortunately. There are many drunkards who are around today who are completely manipulated by spirits who cause them to drink so much that they're still standing up, they're completely unconscious and they're still standing up drinking. You don't think that's a personal kind of choice? Well, to keep getting plastered? It, it is a personal choice. There is a personal emotion driving it, yes, but there is also an association with a spirit who also wants to continue the choice for the person because the spirit doesn't get to drink in the spirit world, so they want to share what the person does on earth. So they attach to somebody. They attach to somebody on earth who does who does it and who they. What, what does the spirit get out of that? Well, they get the feeling of being drunk, just like the person does. Oh, without yeah. actually drinking. Yeah. Any. So, you know, if you take a drug on Earth, yeah. sometimes you have a certain sort of physiological feeling, yeah. and a lot of that is caused by what it does to your spirit body. Well, if a spirit connects to you while you're taking that drug, he gets to share that same feeling. Yeah, on that, there, there's this drug called a DMT. Have you heard of it? Um, what's its real it's, name? It's uh, dimethyltryptamine. Yes, I've heard of it. Yeah. yeah, so it's literally the molecule that is produced in your brain when you dream. Yeah. And when you smoke it or do it, whatever. It causes it, uh, lucid hallucinations. Yeah, everything around it turns into a dream. Yes. And they did this study, I believe, at some university where uh, somebody, a few people smoked like 100 milligrams of it and they all made contact with some sort of spiritual entity. Exactly. And do you think that's part of the mind playing games on you, or is that no, an actual person, an entity that they're making contact? With? Yeah, there are there is a there are certain drugs on the planet that assist people to make contact with spiritual entities. Like what? Um, well, that is one of them. Uh, yeah, there are some uh, mushrooms that do the same kind of thing, mm. uh, and other and other forms of drugs too. So you think taking those is like kind of like opening the door to other dimensions? So C so. Certainly, inside yeah. inside of the individual. Yeah. However, you're always open to other dimensions, but this is more just having a, a, a lucid memory about such an opening. Right. Now, the but I I don't agree that that you would actually be attracting very bright or what I would call loving people in mm -hmm. this interaction. So, so while it might be a very interesting experience in the sense that you get to talk to people who are not living on this planet anymore and you get to find out about their life and all these other things that you can get to feel about, um, at the end of the day, if it doesn't teach you to become more loving, then you have to sort of question why bother doing it. Yeah. Um, if it's just an experience, then we must you know, I, I believe that all of experiences should be focused on whether they're helping us grow or whether they're helping us remain stagnant or, or go down into a negative spiral. And I believe that experiences that help us grow will always help us to become more loving. Now, there is a potential that certain things, certain demands of these experiences can help us to become more loving by triggering a certain type of investigation that we didn't include, didn't have before. So there are some people who have taken these drugs who before didn't believe there was such a thing as an afterlife, who after taking the drugs believe there is such a thing, and I don't think that's necessarily a negative experience. However, um, if you've got to continually take drugs in order to have a positive experience, then I would question, you know, you can have far more positive experiences by being more loving and mm -hmm. learning how to be more loving than you can by taking drugs. So, yeah. so <clears throat> now let's jump to this. Um, what are your thoughts on the world religions as a whole, and do you think there's a certain religion that has it down? No, I don't, I don't believe there is a certain religion that has it down. <laughs> you know, that or has, everything has a hatred. Yeah. And the main problem that I see with most religions on the planet, well, there's two probably, there are many problems, but there are two main problems. The first main problem is that almost all religions on the planet believe in a punishing God. They all believe that God is a God of judgment who eventually is going to annihilate the wicked and support the righteous. And when you ask them who's the definition of a wicked, well, you know, if it's a person who's a Christian, they'll say, well, the Bible defines who's wicked. And if you ask a Muslim, then they'll say the Quran defines who's wicked. Um, 
and unfortunately the definition of who's wicked seems to change depending on what book you read and of course that's not the case with God. So I see the first problem with, with mankind's religions is they do not understand God yet. God is only loving, God is never punishing, God is never wrathful, God never kills people and God is never going to kill people. So, so once we understand that about God, and if we could change all religions in one way, that would be the first way I'd like to see all religions change, their belief about God. Mm -hmm. Secondly, is their belief about love. Almost all religions have a self-righteous opinion that what they define as right can be imposed upon anybody else. And I do not feel that this is in harmony with any of God's laws or principles or in harmony with the gift of free will. If I do not have the right to impose upon you through force my opinions about God or how I feel I should live. I only can show you through my own actions and my own life how I feel that should happen. If as soon as I try to impose my beliefs upon you, I am now harming your will, your freedom to decide. And I do not feel God ever agrees with that. So, so while it's okay for me to express my opinion, if you ask me what my opinion is, it's not okay for me to force you to, to confer, conform to my opinion. Yeah, well, I mean, with that, I mean, you have a lot of these media outlets and news reports of you being the leader of a dangerous, chilling cult. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I've been here for a few hours now. Yeah. And it's bright and it's hot. There's birds everywhere. Yeah. It's a few. And, uh, <laughs> And there's much, no, it's pretty lax here. So. Yeah, and there's no compound, and there's no headquarters, and there's no... No, what, what's up with that compound? I don't know what's up with it, but it's certainly not here. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, there's, I mean, I've seen pictures of a cross being shaved. Yeah, in, that's and, a neighbor's property about five kilometers away. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that, so I've been lied to about all that, huh? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. There is no compound. No. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> I know that I was expecting, you know, what, not really I was expecting, but the, the way they portray you is like, you're the leader of a dangerous cult. Mm -hmm. um, everybody told me, at, coming here, that had seen those videos, don't drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> and uh, I had, I had, first thing I did was have a meal with you guys, and drinking your water. And, and, and not so, Kool-Aid. Yeah, not Kool-Aid either. <laughs> but like, you know, you don't have a bunch of weird, crazy people around you that... No. Uh, no. I, I don't, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty surreal that everything I was expecting, or everything that I was told to expect coming here, yeah. I didn't get at all. Exactly. Um, and yeah, we've we've done recently some answers to all that on our website, but you know, unfortunately, the media—I don't know what they are like in the USA, but here they seem to have a tendency to lie when they oh, feel, feel like they've got a boat to push in the right direction. How do you feel about being considered the leader of a cult, a dangerous cult? Well, I know I'm not the leader of anybody. If I was a leader of a cult, I'm not a very good leader because <laughs> nobody follows me. <laughs> so uh, basically all Mary and I do is... Uh, but you're Jesus, though. Like, yeah, well, you don't we, have any followers. Not really. We, and the we, way they've portrayed you as having 100,000 followers or DVDs in circulation. And oh, yeah. We, you know, we, we present seminars, we video everything, mm -hmm. and we just give it away. And, uh, and that's all we do. And people come along who love the material and they donate funds to, for us to give away more. And that's how things have grown. We've, we've just had people who are generous with us because we've usually been generous with them as well um, in terms of our time and our energy. And, and, so they, and they love the material that they're learning. And so what they do is they share it with others and then, and then some of them donate some funds to us, which means we can produce more and then we share it with more. And that's basically how it works. It's really, all myself and Mary do is really uh, do seminars. That's yeah. really all we do, where people can come for free. And, uh, and unfortunately, sometimes they have to sit down for four hours and listen to a guy speak, which some of them <laughs> usually don't like doing, although we just had 200, you know, this weekend who loved doing it. And they were, you know, they were do, fine. So. Do you think it'd be more, um, I guess, more successful, I guess, so to say, if you kind of approach these seminars saying that you weren't Jesus and just teaching. Certainly, yeah, I would definitely be more successful. Uh, in fact, in fact, I'd probably 
everyone would probably be watching my DVDs more you know, all around the world if that was the case. The reality is my saying that I'm Jesus causes huge amounts of mistrust in people. Mm. They, they then feel it, it's not the way to a person's heart. <laughs> in fact, it's quite the opposite. It's a way to put off a person initially. And however, I have to say who I am if I'm being truthful and honest. So when I'm asked, I'll say. Um, yeah, and, and so that's, that's why I say I'm Jesus, because I am. Um, I'm Jesus, deal with it. Yeah, yeah and, and it's interesting you quote that, but like there's 700 hours of seminars and stuff on YouTube, yeah. and uh, there's one two-hour session where I, where I talked about that. Yeah. In fact, that's the only two-hour session that I've actually talked about myself for two hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> Feels of, weird, doesn't it? Of 700 hours of yeah. material. So, you know, that's the media again. They love taking everything out of context and they love putting, you know, emphasis on things they like putting on. And I'm sure they've got a group of people that have gone through the whole 700 hours looking for, you know, material that they feel they can snapshot and edit and, and present negatively. No, and I've seen hours of that footage and just noticing that a lot of it is just talking not so much about you at all. It's all about talking about, you know, how to beat your addictions, how to be positive, how yes, to yeah. spirits, everything. Yeah, a lot of it is all about, uh, well, I will speak generally on any subject that right. an audience wants to listen to about, right? that I also feel attracted to speaking about. Um, we get invited uh, to places to speak and, and we go as a result of that. We don't pre-arrange much, as most people are aware. We don't, uh, and in fact, we, we, we very rarely pre-arrange venues or anything like that. We, we like to go where people want to hear, and if people don't want to hear, then I'm perfectly happy staying at home and <laughs> working on my garden, you know. Um, but I, myself and Mary do love sharing what we feel is the truth to other people. We, it's just a beautiful experience. We meet a lot of very beautiful people, and uh, we have a fantastic lifestyle as a result. We don't work. Uh, in the sense, in a traditional way, I suppose it's very similar to your lifestyle in a way, in that you're doing what you're passionate about, we do what we're passionate about, we, you get people who obviously provide funds to you because you do what you're passionate about, it's very similar for us, we don't have a charge for anything, we just give everything we do away. No, yeah. that's, that's, that's probably the one thing that stood out the most, is that you know, most religions go off of money, 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 Scientology is yeah. money, yeah. you know, and uh, you're basically going off donations. Yeah, we, we, myself and Mary live off of donations yeah. uh, uh, that are given to us. And, and the way we see it is that if people would like to give to us, then that's great. If we don't expect them to, and if, we, if they don't, then we're perfectly happy to do something else uh, to have the funds that we need to live. As it's turned out in the last five years, we haven't had to do that for five years. Uh, so we've been able to live off of the donations of very generous people for that period of time. And we've been able to do a lot of the things we love in that time because of what they've given us. So we sort of see it like we're very, very grateful for our for our life and lifestyle. And we, but we also spend a lot of our life sharing as much as we can with other people too, without expecting anything in return. So now, can I just say something, yeah. Adam? We, we aren't setting up a religion. Uh, mm -hmm. We have no. There is no priesthood, there is no cult, there is no religious faith, there is no doctrine, there is no uh, things that are forced upon a person to practice, there is no excommunication if they don't practice it. And we just basically, all we've ever done is just share the principles of what we believe love to be with others. And a lot of people feel attracted to it. Yeah. That's, that's why, you know, people ask us to speak. But, but that's, that's all it is. There's no formal arrangement in any, in any way. We do have an organisation called God's Way of Love, which is, and what we're trying to do in that organisation is to share, is to show people in practice what love would do for the environment and for each other by having an organisation that's sort of based around those principles. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, I'm running low on batteries. That's okay. Today. Can we stop? Right. Yeah, yeah. So we only yeah. have a few more. Left. Yeah, that's fine. That was great. That last part was probably probably one of the most important parts to share. Yeah. Saying that, you know, not a call, not this, this, this. Yeah. I think that, that was, like, yeah. that's very important. So, because um, I mean, just watching all the media stuff and then jumping to your, like, you know, you, you go a few more videos up and down on YouTube and you see that 
it's not really. All yeah, the that. interesting thing is uh, that a lot of the people who heard the initial negative media stuff, yeah. what happened was that they heard the me the media stuff, and then they looked on our site or looked on the YouTube channel, yeah. and then what they realised was that um, that most of what the media said was false, and a lot of people have actually. Have, have actually watched more of the material since they heard about it on the media than they would, did before. So, well, it's like, yeah. like how, I mean, one of the first things they did was uh, they put in children. And whenever the media wants to really mess with you, they'll throw anything with children in mm -hmm. to really get you against them. Yeah, well, like, they, uh, that was one of the first parts in yeah. one of those things. Yeah, well, their underlying motive is to try to implicate me in some kind of child abuse or something mm -hmm. like that, you know. And this is their general attack, I feel, on, on... And I believe probably a lot of so-called cult leaders are involved in child... I don't know. I, like, I've never met many of them, so I don't know. <laughs> but... Um, you know, they just play, uh, to me, they play on the fears of human society by feeding them a heap of stuff that's false and then hoping that most of the society will believe it and then be, be in an uproar about something that's false. And it's quite strange when we get uh, emails because we, people send us an email with all the terrible things that we've done and we write back to them saying, look, we've never done any of those things. <laughs> and, and they write back to us saying, that can't be true because the media told me. Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> like as if <laughs> they'll listen to the tie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's like so. What, with all that happening, like, what really, what really is your feelings towards the media about how they've portrayed you in general? Well, I feel I be recording this. Film, right? That's okay. We're, we're recording. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I feel that. Um, like my feelings are I need to love the media as much as I need to love everyone else and the media are just a part of society that needs a lot of love you know they, they obviously have a very uh, a lot of dark there's a lot of darkness in the media in the sense of a lot of negative and negative en energy negative stuff based around fear and, and I feel that uh, you know basically they need to learn how to love and and the best way I can teach the media to learn how to love is to have some, have some ethics in my relationship with the media. So, so what I'm attempting to do is I say to the media, look, you can interview me, but we're, we, are going to, we are going to record you interviewing me now. Mm -hmm. And most of the media refuse under those circumstances because they, they don't have the option of editing out everything mm -hmm. then. Um, and that then, you know, they love editing because editing allows them to tell a story that they want to tell without editing, the truth. music all that stuff exactly yeah oh, I, I love the fact that they, they have this picture of you that pops up where you're just kind of like yeah <laughs> you know, I, was probably, I was probably in a seminar as you know I act up a bit in the seminars so. and then I looked like the <laughs> sun was shining in your eye or something yeah. you just yeah. it away and in the seminars I generally act up a bit and I put on all sorts of faces and whatever else and I'm sure they've had you know people going through all of those seminars which are in their two hour you know blocks on YouTube uh, looking for the exact moment that I do something and they grab that and put uh, that as a steal, yeah. you know? Yeah, no, it's just, <laughs> media is a monster. It's, they, they know how to get that stuff down. Yeah, I, be, I believe the media uh, could be, and I feel a lot of the media, the underlying principles of the media that began many hundreds of years ago started from some very good basic principles about freedom of speech, the, will, the ability to let everybody know what is actually happening rather than having everything hidden. You know, so there was a lot of very good underlying principles guiding the inception of, of the media industry. Mm -hmm. I just believe, unfortunately, like many other things on this planet, it's become so diluted with a lot of unloving fear-based you know, manipulation that, that in the end it now hasn't become, it's not a, no longer a force for the good that it was originally created for. I believe it can return to that. And in fact, in a lot of ways, I believe that uh, um, more and more people are starting to desire the media to return to that. You know, mm -hmm. more and more people are getting sick and tired of the, of the you know, misconceptions and manipulation. Yeah. Now, so is it true that like uh, the Australian authorities, I guess, have told people to stay clear from you? Uh, I don't know. Um, Do you get messed with with the authorities? Do they like ever? Never. Like I've yeah. never been messed with. I've had, we've had uh, initially a couple of years ago, uh, along with the media attacks, 
we had quite a lot of people phoning the tax office saying that we weren't paying tax and all this kind of stuff mm. and saying that I, you know, that I was, that I owned all this property that I didn't own and all this kind of thing, you know, um, and so, and so the tax office investigated us and, uh, and they gave us a clean bill of health in a letter and, and, you know, uh, they understand that we only own this property that you've come to. Uh, we don't own any other property. There are people we know who own other properties who invite us to their properties at times and also who invite us to, um, you know, share with them what we believe would be good for the property in terms of harmony with love. But we don't have any control of it. We don't own the property. And, uh, and we have no desire to own any more properties than this one. Um, and in fact, we feel in the long run, we might not own any property. Um, so, you know, there's a lot, even there, there was a lot. And I, it was interesting writing and actually working with the tax office, answering some of their questions because it's Did hard. You becoming friends with them or what? Well, yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's hard to answer a question where there's no evidence to support them. Yeah. So, for example, right. they ask me for a list of all the properties I own, so I give them my property. And they say, well, you don't own this one, this one. No, I don't. You know, other people own them. Do you want me to get them to send you a list of what they own? <laughs> you know, like, no, they don't because they're just investigating me. Okay. You know, but it's hard to prove that something isn't true when it's never happened. Right. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, a lot, uh, uh, you know, there must have been some people who believe these things, and I don't know how they do because I've been pretty open about how everything's begun, you know, happened on the net. But uh, I feel there's a lot of mis... You know, the media says some things and then everybody believes that to be true and then everybody, it's like Chinese whispers, you know, it all turns into a, a mountain when it wasn't even a molehill to begin with. Um, and I feel that that's really what's happened with a lot of, you know, a lot of people in Australia probably believe things about us and even a lot of people in our community probably believe things about us mm. that are not true based on what the media has stated. Um, but but all I can do is suggest to them, look, investigate it fully right. rather than just believing what's put in your face by people who have an obvious motive, yeah. which is to gain your ratings and to have some advertising revenue, you know? Yeah, I know, just, just watching those videos and seeing how the media had edited and portrayed everything was like, you just kind of turn the music off and you kind of just really just pay attention to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It's not so much dangerous or chilling no in fact most people who feel that it makes a lot of sense <laughs> I mean, yeah i guess i guess so i yeah. guess that's why i'm here too and even if they don't agree with what i'm saying um they certainly don't feel that it's got any negative you know uh, ability to harm a person's life by following you know. yeah yeah We've been, we've been accused of all sorts of things, hey? Like, we've been accused of killing children and all sorts of things. <laughs> Man, it's just like, we don't even... We've been accused of breaking up families, for example. And, and in fact, on video, Igor, who's behind the camera there, um, has been accused of, of breaking... I've been accused of breaking his family and his marriage up. Mm. Well, his wife's just there, right? <laughs> and they're still married, and mm. they're still in a relationship together. Um, so, you know, it's all just, and, and ironically, the guy who interviewed knew that. Mm. That's the sad thing, I feel. He was a minister of religion who did the interview, and he knew that Igor was still married to Lena and that they are still together. He knew that, and yet he still implied through his words that wasn't the case. Well, I think that's more of a personal choice if they're deciding to leave somebody yeah. rather than you telling them. Exactly. Are you telling them? No, something? not at all. Um, in fact, we tell people that they need to stay in relationships and work through the issues mm. unless um, somebody is being abusive in the relationship. So if someone's being angry all the time and abusive or, or violently abusive, then of course you would never encourage the person who's on the receiving end of that to stay in the relationship. Um, we, but we encourage people to, to work through the issues of love if after they work through the issues of love, they still do not believe that they can live in a loving re arrangement or a relationship with this person because they no longer have any strong sexual desire for them, then leave mm. and give that person the freedom to make a choice to, to live with somebody else who, who does have those kind of feelings for them. But, but we never, we, we've, it's very rare for us to give personal advice to any, to any couple 
And, and what we're trying to do lately is that there are some couples who are wanting personal advice and what we're thinking of doing is actually putting them all around a table like this, mm -hmm. getting a couple of cameras in there and then making sure that any advice that we give them is recorded for public knowledge so that they can actually see what advice So they really can't mess with you. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So the main reason why we record these interviews now is because we've been messed with so much yeah. <laughs> that in the end uh, we've had to just you know, go ahead and record them just as a way for us to prove that a lot of the things that are being said uh, are just so, so totally incorrect. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, whether I believe you're Jesus or not, I didn't want to portray you in any way that the media already has, because it's already been done, really. Yeah, and to be honest, I don't even feel it's important that anybody believes that I'm Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just tired of dealing with the fact that people are saying to me, Oh, because you're saying I'm Jesus, I can't listen to anything else you've got to say. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that's pretty illogical. Well, that's, a lot of times that's a deal breaker right off the bat. Yeah, it is. Most, most yeah. of the time, unfortunately. I also don't believe that just because I'm saying I'm Jesus that I'm like every other person who's saying they're Jesus. Mm -hmm. I also don't believe that just because I'm saying I'm Jesus that I'm a leader of a cult, because I'm not. I also don't believe that just because I'm saying I'm Jesus that it means I want to start a new religion, because I don't. Um, you know, so there's all these suppositions that are made uh, and, and misconceptions that people have in their own life, you know, begins in their own life about Jesus, that they then think that, oh, because I'm saying I'm Jesus, it means all these other things, and it doesn't. My suggestion is, if they really want to know what it means, there's 700 hours of videos on the net right at this moment yeah. for free, that they can have a look at what it really means, and, and they can either agree or disagree with that. It doesn't really worry me whether they agree or disagree. <laughs> I'm just doing what I'm passionate about doing and what I sincerely believe in. Um, and I know who I am, I don't need anybody to tell me, and I certainly don't want anybody to worship me in any way or to follow me just because I'm Jesus. In fact, the majority of people don't follow me because I say I'm Jesus, which is the irony. The media, the media are accusing people that follow me because I'm saying I'm Jesus. Mm -hmm. If you ask most of the people who, who listen to me, they say that they're despite the fact that I'm saying I'm Jesus. Yeah. So. Guarantee if you said you weren't Jesus, I mean, yeah, the success would probably be you could have books out and all that. Yeah, you know. yeah. Um, the, I, I, one of my favorite things I saw was uh, this homemade video of, a, I think it was an evangelical Christian woman that uh, was like, Jesus did not have relations with Mary Magdalene. Jesus is <laughs> yeah. holy and yeah. whatever person, just yeah. whatever. And that, that really cracked me up because it's like, that's what you believe. <laughs> that's, that's well, the interesting right. thing is for her, she lives there in this life and obviously she, as a Christian, would not proclaim she had a previous one. So she's living 2,000 years after I existed in the first century, mm. making suppositions on books that were written 300 years after I was on earth. Yeah. Um, about my life. Now, the reality is I lived my life in the first century and so did Mary and we know whether we had a relationship or not. Whether anybody wants to believe us is really, doesn't really feel very important to us. The reality is we know who we are. We also know what relationship we had. If people want to believe that I was pure and holy and never had a sexual relationship, well, they're able to believe that if that's what they want. I'm suggesting to them that, that it causes a lot of damage to their own faith when they do that. Yeah, what happened between 12 and 30? <laughs> exactly. I mean, puberty and uh, being 21. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe a lot of things happened in that time that nobody wanted to talk about. Right. <laughs> yeah. There's this book called Lamb. Yep. Um, and it's, a, it's the perspective of Jesus' best friend, Biff from the ages of 12 to 30. It's, yeah. pretty, it's pretty great. Book. Yeah, that sounds like it might be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Book. Yeah. His best friend being named Biff. Yeah, yeah. Back to the future. Yeah, no, I, I feel like it's, uh, you know, unless the person was there, they really do not know. <laughs> yeah. And unless they remember being there, they're really just making suppositions. So. Yeah. It's a bit like me coming along to your life like 2,000 years time and telling everybody what Adam Vu was like. Nah. <laughs> you know? I wouldn't yeah. trust that guy at all. <laughs> well, it, it would be one thing if I knew you. That would probably be okay. But, but, if, but if I'm talking about you 2,000 years hence, 
without even having ever seen you or knowing you, then then what can my conceptions of you be? Like they can only be what folklore has determined. Mm-hmm. Right. One second. Okay, I need a new memory card out. No problem. Okay. All right. So, where are we okay. at right now? You're rolling. Yeah. So, what are your feelings towards uh, other people who have claimed to be the second coming of Christ or the Messiah? Well, uh, I feel well compassion for them, probably more mm-hmm. than anything. Um, I understand what's happening in almost every case. You know, they they're being influenced by groups of spirits in the spirit world who are quite dark in their attitudes and nature. And, and you know, I have compassion for anybody who's being influenced negatively by spirits. Like I said, I know who I am. I'm not, I don't have an investment in uh, proving who, who I am. I feel that will come in time anyway. Um, I don't feel there's any need for me to attack them. I feel, I feel our conduct will demonstrate, you know, who's the most realistic yeah. person who's claiming to be Jesus. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't really feel any negative uh, feelings towards them at all. Um, there are probably over 100,000 people or so on the planet who believe they're Jesus. And I've lived the last 2,000 years with probably a couple of million spirits in the spirit world who, who often claim that they're Jesus to people on earth. And so, you know, it's something that's happened all of my life. I also believe it happens to many other people who pass from the earth, who were known on the earth, part they pass into the spirit world, and many other spirits take on their identity and then come and talk to people on earth and so forth and try to convince people on earth that they are the reincarnation of that person. Mm. And it happens very regularly for a lot of different people other than just myself. Yeah. Mm. One second, guys. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. Um, I know this wasn't in the list of questions, but right. I, I forgot to throw it in. Um, you're a firm believer of uh, the end of the world stuff, right? Not really, no. So everything that I've heard about the 2012 or uh, the things that are going to take this world apart yeah. that I've seen in the media, has that been just kind of meshed to their benefit? Yeah, it's a big distortion of the truth. Um, I do believe that the world and the earth itself is probably going to go through some fairly big changes. I feel that we historically have, there are records historically in both the fossil record and in the ice core record and so forth, there's records of the cyclical changes that occur to the earth over periods generally of around 15,000 years or so. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that we are going through one of those changes right at this point in time. So I do believe there will be, you know, physical changes to the earth during that period. I don't believe in an end of the world scenario or a, or, or an Armageddon cataclysm like the Christians would believe in. So December twenty first, two thousand twelve, means nothing. No, God has no dates. Um, so a date means very little. Uh, I feel it's a prediction that somebody has obviously made, which will, might turn out to be true or not. But uh, at the end of the day, dates mean very little. We, we can see, though, a general thing going on on the planet. For example, we can see that the planet is going through some environmental changes that, that we're obviously participating in. Now, whether they are caused by humanity or caused by something else, we can't be sure at this point because there's not enough scientific evidence to sort of lead either direction. Mm. And I believe if mankind spent a bit more of their money but rather t- took away some of their money spent on arms mm. and put that money spent into science in a practical in practical ways and particularly looking at the earth and how the earth looks after itself and maintains itself I feel we'd have some very clear answers as to whether things are going to occur in a short period of time or not so I have a very more much more of a scientific approach but I also know that there are large numbers of people in the spirit world and here on earth who do believe that the earth will go through cataclysmic changes. Now I don't necessarily agree that they will be as bad as what people believe. You know, some people believe the earth itself might even be destroyed. I know many Christians believe that. Um, I don't believe that at all. I don't believe in an end of the world scenario. I feel the world will go on for many centuries to come. I do believe though that we are going through some very major changes some of which will be physically based on the earth itself and some of which I feel and I I hope the majority of which will be 
based upon people on the earth desiring to become more harmonious with each other and live in a more peaceful environment. So I feel those changes are the changes that I'm preparing for, that they're the ones that I, I want to participate in, actually. So what I've heard about how your compound in over here yeah. is safe from everything that's going to be happening, yeah. that's bull. Yeah, well, you know, the reality is there are certain places on Earth that I do believe are safer than other places mm. on Earth. Um, you know, it's pretty obvious that there are some places on Earth that are, that are pretty close to having some kind of cataclysmic change occur because of what we know historically, uh, seismically and otherwise, uh, would occur to those particular places, California being one. Um, yeah, so, you know, but um, I don't believe that a person can come to a supposed safe location and expect to be safe without addressing some of their own disharmony with love that exists inside of their own soul. While we have fear inside of us, we attract fearful events. Mm. And, uh, and so I don't believe anybody who moves near me is automatically going to be safe, for example. Right. Yeah. So, all right, last question and then. Uh, if you could know the answer to any question, what would it be? Yeah, that was a very difficult uh, thing, but probably it's the question that I'm asked quite frequently that I can't answer yet and I, that I would really love to uh, be able to answer. And that is, how did God come into existence? Mm. That, that's a question that uh, I am frequently asked from people five years of age right the way through to people on their deathbed uh, when we're talking about God. And it is a question that I, that I just don't have the answer for yet. I do believe that at some point in the future, God might share the answer but the problem I see that I've had in the past is that every answer God's given me, I've had to actually have had a very good grounding in other things first before I could understand the answer. It's a bit like you, if you went to a university course uh, when you were five years of age, you probably wouldn't understand anything because you needed the grounding in language and you needed the grounding in mathematics and you needed the grounding in all these other different things before you can understand the answer. And that's what I feel relationship with God is like. God's, God's giving us information that we're ready for at the time to get us ready for the next group of information. And that, that next bit of information will get us ready for the next bit of information. Uh, and without us going through this process of learning, it's impossible to answer questions, huge questions such as, what did the Creator do? When, when I don't even know fully how to control my own life. Mm. Um, so I feel that firstly I have to learn fully how to control my life, I have to learn and understand about love, I have to learn and understand about divine truth in all these different areas, I've got to develop myself, I've got to understand a lot of different things before the Creator can share with me some answers that, of questions that I'd really like to know the answer of. Mm. Yeah. AJ? Jesus, it's a pleasure. <laughs> no it's a pleasure. Right. No All right, it's, uh, it's been great meeting you too. Yeah, yeah, it's let's been really. Uh, yeah. Let's get a little tour together. Sure, yeah. yeah. Awesome. <laughs>